memorial is being installed in Midtown St. Louis. The artist, Damon Davis, refers to it as a mile-long memorial, with sculptures and inscriptions dotting a new greenway that connects Harris Stowe University to the new professional soccer stadium. The memorial intends to honor Mill Creek Valley, a black neighborhood that was once deeply rooted along that mile of Midtown, only to be intentionally displaced in the early 60s in the name of urban renewal. This land then underwent cycle after cycle of development, ultimately rendering it unrecognizable and nearly uninhabitable for any type of organic community. This is the story not only of Mill Creek Valley, but a region of St. Louis so mismanaged that no amount of development or redevelopment could rekindle the kind of thriving community that was wiped out here. How does a neighborhood home to 20,000 citizens get wiped off the face of a city? And how does urban renewal, a process supposedly meant to improve the city, wind up deserving a memorial? To address these questions, let's first clarify the difference between urban redevelopment and urban renewal. The Federal Housing Act was passed in 1949, giving cities wildly increased powers to buy and redevelop land for so-called public use, as well as a new pool of funds with which to do it. Public use required the city to justify the project and prove that it benefited the overall state of the city. While development could be anything new built in a city, for the purposes of this story, renewal is any federally backed project using funds from Title I of the Federal Housing Act. One of the most common ways to justify, quote, public use and to receive FHA approval was to critique housing quality. Officials would refer to any low quality or old housing as blighted, and by convincing people that this so-called blight would spread, infecting the nearby neighborhoods, governments could often get approval and funding for large-scale demolition. And by altering their definition of what constitutes blight, cities could effectively target any neighborhoods they wanted. Cities all over the country were eager to use and abuse this newfound power. Local governments took turns exchanging the title for most expensive or biggest urban renewal project in America. This map shows renewal project locations with circles proportional to the number of families displaced by that project. So let's focus on Mill Creek Valley. Mill Creek Valley received just over $23 million in federal funding, making it one of the most expensive projects in FHA history and disproportionately expensive for St. Louis's population, with most of the more expensive projects located in much larger cities, such as San Francisco or Chicago. This chart shows the number of families displaced, as well as the proportion of families of color. At over 4,000 families displaced and 97% families of color, it becomes very clear why this project was a problem. St. Louis was about to undertake one of the most one-sided, costly, and unfair urban renewal projects of all time. But why in Mill Creek Valley? The Mill Creek Valley neighborhood can be traced well into the 1700s as an industrial site along a creek that used to run the length of the city into the Mississippi River. The neighborhood was a perfect location for the Industrial Revolution era factories that needed to be placed slightly outside of downtown and workers, hotels, tenements, and other businesses that came with them, creating the working class community that it became known for. As a majority black community, Mill Creek Valley took to providing itself with necessities that the city wouldn't. And beginning in the early 1900s, we see vast archives proving that they created a thriving and unique culture there. This YMCA was a pillar of the community. It housed and fed black troops with nowhere else to go during peacetime, held meetings for one of the most active NAACP chapters in the country, and printed a weekly newsletter that informed the people and fostered a sense of community and identity. Just down the street was the People's Finance Corporation, the only Black-owned financing institution in the entire city. In 1926, People's Finance opened their own building, also home to Black unions, two locally owned newspapers, and many small businesses. The People's Finance Building was the economic counterpart to the social YMCA, which together provided countless much-needed services for the community. The St. Louis Stars were an original eight team in the baseball's Negro National League, and they opened their very own park in Mill Creek Valley in 1922. Stars Park was the first ever Black-owned professional ball field in America, and the Stars themselves were an incredibly popular team. 
winning three NNL World Championships between 1925 and 1930, and producing three Hall of Fame careers, the Stars were not only independent from any white-owned team, but more popular and skilled than many as well. Their existence alone, coupled with their success and popularity, demonstrates the lengths that Mill Creek Valley would go to to be independent and self-sustaining. To quote Bob Kendrick, president of the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum, wherever you had successful black baseball, you had thriving black economies. Unfortunately, many houses in Mill Creek Valley lacked indoor plumbing or adequate access to windows, fire escapes, and other necessities. Mill Creek Valley had done exceptionally well for itself over the years, but housing laws were changing, and instead of investing in community upgrades and helping improve living conditions, well, the city took the easy way out. In 1950, Mayor Darst announced that St. Louis was intent on using the new FHA funding to tackle slums, blight, and obsolescence through clearance. Just four years later, the city had settled on a location. Having ignored Mill Creek Valley's potential as a cultural center for decades, the city now labeled it as St. Louis's number one eyesore, advertising the renewal plan as a five-year project and promising new apartments and educational buildings. The project was entrusted to longtime St. Louis planner and noted supporter of segregation, Harland Bartholomew. By 1958, the final redevelopment plan was complete and even local NAACP president Ernest Calloway was advocating for it, saying they promised a, quote, fair share of the good jobs for local Negro citizens. The only dissenting alderman was Archie Blaine, whose district contained 97% of the area to be cleared. Blaine explained his position, saying he was, quote, in favor of better housing, but not in favor of moving slums to other parts of the city. However, the city had already deceived its way into a passing vote, and demolition was scheduled. Demolition was quick and dirty, and the buildings came down well before any preparations had been made. Wrecking balls and bulldozers turned on the YMCA, People's Finance, and Stars Park. Some of the first and finest Black-owned establishments in the Midwest were torn down within days of each other on the orders of the city. While the mayor, planners, and engineers posed for groundbreaking photos, the citizens of a proud and innovative community were scattered, helpless. Property owners had been paid a fraction of what they deserved for their buildings, and essentially no accommodations or backup plans were made for displaced citizens. Progress halted nearly as quickly as it began, Within a year, any buildings still standing had been trashed, and weeds were growing in the lots where families used to live. Within five years, construction on the highway, one of the major reasons for the project in the first place, was hardly progressing. The buildings had come down so fast, and progress since then had been so achingly slow, that by the mid-60s, St. Louisans had taken to calling the area Hiroshima Flats. In 1966, one of the first redeveloped uses for the land was finally completed. An experimental mixed-race and mixed-income housing project known as Laclede Town, the town was designed as a counter to the pruitt Igo complex that had failed some years prior, only blocks away. With its high-quality, low-rise apartments and mixed-use planning, Laclede Town had everything you could hope for out of redevelopment, except one thing, enough units. At open, Laclede Town had only 285 units, and its experimental nature meant that most of those units went to people who were new in the area and not those displaced by the construction. By the mid-70s, McLeed Town was up to over a thousand units and was thriving. However, even at its height, McLeed Town never approached the amount of housing that had been destroyed and never catered to those who needed it most. Ultimately, due to mismanagement and failing maintenance, by the mid-80s, anyone with the means to move out had left. And by 1990, McLeed Town was over 60% vacant some 200 residents still called Laclede Town home when it was demolished in 1995 in, ironically, yet another act of slum clearance. All while Laclede Town was following the same path as Mill Creek Valley before it, the rest of the area had been used mostly for non-residential purposes. Over 40 years, Midtown St. Louis had gone from housing 20,000 people down to just a couple hundred to now almost none. Hard lines formed by the highway and the new built environment separated people and made living there nearly impossible. 
These maps tell Mill Creek Valley's story through numbers, but you can't truly grasp the tragedy of what occurred there without the people, without the YMCA, People's Finance, or the St. Louis Stars. That is exactly the point of the memorial. No one wants to face the reality that their city is responsible for tragedy and destruction of culture, but this memorial is the first step in the right direction. Until now, St. Louis has never really acknowledged Mill Creek Valley. The highway makes no mention of it. The records are scarce and hard to find. While this memorial does nothing to help the 20,000 people displaced in the 20th century, this type of recognition and remembrance is pivotal for society's understanding of cities and how to improve them going forward.